right, so we continue with our discussion of the spherical derivative. Okay, so um, there are there are a few things I uh, I wanted to point out uh, with regard to the spherical derivative. Okay, so so let me uh, so let me just recall uh, uh, if uh, f of z uh, uh, is a uh, in a domain d is a varying over capital D, which is a domain in C. Uh, uh, is a meromorphic function uh, function uh, that is f belongs to m of d and uh, mind you the the set of meromorphic functions on d is considered now as a subset of uh, you know in fact uh, uh, continuous maps from d to the extended complex plane which is C union infinity okay. So the script C uh, denotes continuous maps and uh, the point is that you make the meromorphic function continuous even at it at the poles by defining the function value at the pole to be infinity okay. So you consider it like this and uh, uh, then the spherical derivative Uh, of f is f hash of z it is defined to be 2 times mod f dash of z divided by 1 plus mod f z the whole square. This is the definition of the spherical derivative and uh, mind you uh, why, why did we need the spherical derivative it is because uh, of the following reason. Uh, so suppose the you have this is the complex plane uh, with the variable z and you have this suppose this is your uh, this uh, the area inside this dotted region is your domain d and suppose you had a, an arc gamma inside d now you take the image of this arc gamma under f uh, in, uh, in in the external complex plane okay. So it means that you know you are allowing also the value infinity. So for example you know gamma may pass through a pole of f okay f is a meromorphic function. So f is meromorphic on d means f is uh, holomorphic and that is analytic on d except for a subset of isolated points of d where f has poles okay. But at the poles also the value of f has been defined to be infinity. So uh, your gamma your curve gamma can pass through the poles. Uh, and that is a technical thing that I want to explain to you about. Now you, you identify this extended complex plane via the stereographic projection with the Riemann sphere uh, uh, which I will briefly draw like this. So this is the Riemann sphere which is S2 okay and this, this, uh, this isomorphism is actually a homeomorphism uh, uh, given by the stereographic projection. This is a stereographic projection with the with the point with the point infinity going to the north pole, which is this point here. All right, and the fact is that the image of gamma will see the gamma will give you uh, you know uh, uh, if you take the image of gamma, what will happen is that you will get you will get some uh, curve here on the Riemann sphere. Okay, see it's a curve in the external complex plane, but you know you are uh, thinking of the external complex plane as a Riemann sphere, so you think of you, ima you imagine that the image of gamma is a curve on the Riemann sphere itself okay and what is that curve this is just this is just f of gamma okay this is f of gamma and uh, what is the what is the big deal about this spherical derivative the big deal about the spherical derivative is that you can get the spherical length of f of gamma okay you can calculate the length of that image curve okay and I have put subscript s for spherical length because it is the length you are, com you are computing the arc length on the on the sphere okay and how do you get it you get it in the following way you simply integrate over gamma uh, with the uh, variable see normally you know if you integrate over mod dz uh, uh, if you integrate over mod dz simply on the plane over a curve gamma you will simply get the arc length of the curve okay that is what integrate integrating over mod dz means because mod dz is infinitesimal arc length on the euclidean plane 
on on C on complex plane on the complex plane thought of as a R2 okay it is a usual arc length but you know if you put if instead of uh, instead of doing this suppose I put if I add the magnification factor given by the uh, suppose I add the magnification factor given by the spherical derivative so that means I put f hash uh, of z here and do this then what you will get is uh, I will get actually the length of the image curve on the Riemann sphere okay and uh, so this is where the spherical derivative is used okay the spherical derivative will give it is uh, so you know without this if I if I do not see if I remove this spherical derivative factor okay I will get simply integral over gamma mod dz and that is just length of gamma but if you put the spherical derivative there okay then I will not get the length of gamma but I will get the length of the image of gamma under f and mind you gamma can pass through yeah it can pass through a pole the only thing is it means that this image curve will pass through the north pole that is all it is it, not going to create any problems because if it passes through a pole the function value there is infinity and infinity corresponds to the north pole on the Riemann sphere under the stereographic projection so the so the point is the importance of the spherical derivative is that it gives you this spherical length okay but there are uh, there are a few uh, uh, technical things about this uh, 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 um, there, there are a few uh, technical things about the spherical derivative which I just indicated towards the end of my la the last lecture and I want to be more uh, uh, you know uh, elaborate about that. So you see so I want to draw your attention to uh, the to this formula which is a formula for the spherical derivative okay this is a formula for the spherical derivative uh, there is something that uh, is a little uh, uh, troublesome about this formula see when I have defined the uh, and, and you know but before that let me also tell you that here in this uh, in this formula for length spherical length of f of gamma you know if I replace this spherical derivative if I instead of putting f hash of z suppose I put mod f dash of z suppose I put modulus of the derivative of f then what I will get is actually the uh, and assume that f is uh, you know holomorphic function then I will get the image uh, the, le the length of the image of gamma under f then f will map only into the complex plane if f is differentiable okay uh, everywhere on gamma okay then uh, it is not meromorphic so the image of gamma will lie in the plane itself it is not going to go to infinity okay because there are no poles okay and because f is a if you assume f to be an analytic function and then if you integrate over gamma mod f dash of z into mod dz what you will get is length of the image under f but this will be the Euclidean length it will be just the length on the plane but if you integrate over gamma mod dz with the coefficient f hash of z which is a spherical derivative and in addition you allow also f to be uh, meromorphic you will actually get the length of the image curve on the Riemann sphere thought of as the uh, extended plane that is what you have to understand okay fine so uh, you know there is a problem with this uh, at first sight uh, with this definition of f hash because you see there is this f dash here okay f dash is the derivative of f at, at, at the point z but the problem is if z is a pole then you are in trouble there is at a pole the function is certainly not differentiable it is a singular point it is a it is a it is a pakka singular point it is a so honest singular point it is not uh, it is not a removable singularity okay the function is not differentiable all right so you are in trouble so you know if, uh, when I wrote this definition last time you know I was only uh, you know I was trying to uh, heuristically tell you things but now I am going to tell you things more seriously so let us worry about let us worry about this this the, the this this uh, situation so so here is my here is my domain d uh, which is the interior of this uh, dotted line uh, it's it's an it's an open connected set okay in the in this is inside the complex plane and suppose i have a point z not uh, and of course you know i have this map f uh, f is a meromorphic function on d and you know of course f is taking values in c union infinity and and uh, z not is a pole uh, of f uh, of order let us say or of order n okay and of course you know z0 will go to f of z0 uh, which is uh, by definition 
uh, infinity okay this is our definition. Now what about the spherical derivative okay uh, see what is so the question is what is f dash of z naught so this is a this is an issue you see because what is f dash of z naught this we have to worry about this that is the reason is because see suppose I have a gamma suppose I have a path gamma passing through a pole okay then my formula for the length of gamma the spherical length of the image of gamma under f on the Riemann sphere which is identified with the extended plane what is the formula it is L spherical of uh, f of gamma you know that is what I have shown in the, uh, in, the in the previous slide. Uh, uh, the spherical length of f of gamma is integral you integrate over gamma so I put if I put just mod d z I will get just the length of gamma but I put the magnification factor given by uh, the spherical derivative of f with respect to z and what is a uh, spherical derivative of f with respect to z it is uh, well uh, it is f hash of z let me again write it it is 2 times mod f dash of z divided by 1 plus mod f z the whole square this is what it is it's, 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 it was there in the previous side, slide also okay. Now the point is uh, if I put z equal to z0 z0 see now gamma uh, passes through uh, gamma passes through z0 okay. So when I calculate this integral on the right side I have when you do when you when you do an integration you know the variable of integration will lie on the region of integration in, in this case the region of integration is the path gamma. So z will pass through z0 it will vary it at some point z will become z0 but when z becomes z0 there is this integrand which is f dash f hash of z the spherical derivative that is in trouble because you know f hash of z depends on f dash of z0 in the numerator f, f hash of z0 will be uh, will involve f dash of z0 but f dash of z0 does not make sense why because z0 is a pole I cannot differentiate an, uh, an, uh, at a pole. I just cannot find the derivative of pole. So what is a what is a big deal? So that is so you see this formula as we have written it last time has this issue that has to be fixed. And the reason is because uh, the the fact is that uh, as I was telling you last time, uh, even at z naught, this f dash of z naught is not defined, but this this spherical derivative is defined as a finite quantity. That is the beauty. That is the reason why this uh, integral works. Okay, that's what I want to explain to you. So you see, um, uh, so so I uh, let me so, so let me say that. So you see, let's assume that z naught is a pole of order n. So then what happens is that you know you will get a small disk surrounding z naught. So let me use a uh, use uh, use a different color. See, I'll get a small disk surrounding z naught. Okay, I can find a small disk surrounding z naught where z naught is the only pole. Okay, because you know poles of an analytic function are isolated in any case. Okay, and in fact our meromorphic functions are supposed to be uh, having only pole singularities okay the, these are the only singularities that are allowed. So I can find a small disk surrounding z0 where uh, z0 is the only pole and uh, well you know if you if you call this uh, if you call the radius of this, this disk as say epsilon okay then in mod z minus z0 less than epsilon which is the interior of that small disk you see you can write f of z uh, you can write f of z as you know uh, g of z divided by s z minus z0 to the power of n where g uh, of uh, uh, where g of uh, uh, z0 uh, is not 0 okay. So you can you, you can write it like this and and and, and of course g analytic uh, 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 in uh, mod z minus z0 less than epsilon okay. So uh, okay I need a little bit more space let me rewrite that let me just write g analytic okay. I can do this because this is how uh, the function looks near a pole of order capital N okay. Now, now watch carefully uh, let us calculate the derivative of f not at z0 because at z0 you cannot calculate the derivative but in the deleted neighborhood of z0 let us calculate uh, uh, f of z and and here also you know when I when I write this uh, in mod z minus z0 less than epsilon of course z should not be z0 I mean I cannot literally plug in z equal to z0 because z equal to z0 is a pole 
and uh, z minus z0 denominator vanishes I cannot write that. Uh, of course we have agreed to put z equal to z0 and equate it to infinity that is when you consider f to be a function with values in c union infinity but nevertheless if you think of it as a usual uh, function then you do not plug in z equal to z0 because you do not divide by 0 okay and that is the situation you must be if you want if you want to really uh, differentiate things okay. So, uh, so you see now now let us calculate see let us do this calculation see what is so so let me write this in mod z minus z0 less than epsilon z0 equal to z0 okay what is f dash of z f dash of z is just d by dz of f of z which is now g of z by z minus z0 to the power of n okay and you can calculate this by uh, if you want quotient rule uh, uh, from basic calculus so it will be I will get z minus z0 to the power of 2n uh, and I will get uh, what will I get here uh, z minus z0 to the power of n uh, g dash of z uh, plus minus uh, g of z n uh, z minus z0 to the power of n minus 1 okay this is what I get if I do this computation and you see uh, now what you do is see this is all right for z0 equal to z0 all right and you will certainly have a problem if you let z tend to z0 okay limit if you actually see uh, in the usual sense if I let limit z tend to z0 then what will happen is that the uh, in the numerator uh, the first term will uh, go all right the second term well uh, it will go provided uh, n is greater than 1 okay if n equal to 1 I uh, will get g z0 okay but the problem will be the denominator as z tends to z0 uh, I will end up with uh, uh, essentially I will what will happen is that because f has a pole of order capital N at z0 its derivative will have a pole of capital order capital N plus 1 at z0 okay that is that is what could happen. So, it is going to only get worse limit z tends to z0 f dash of z will not exist okay and if the if at the worst case you want to make it exist you can define it to be infinity by thinking of f dash also as a meromorphic function but now with values in c union infinity you can do that but in any case it is not a, a finite it is not a it is not a it is not a proper limit in the usual sense okay you have to include the value infinity but then uh, uh, so I will say limit uh, z tends to z0 uh, f dash of z uh, does not it is not a complex number okay uh, it is if you if you include c union infinity then you can call it as infinity that is uh, but that is not the case okay um, we do not want to include the value infinity when we are talking about derivatives but you see but look at uh, what on the other hand you look at what is uh, f hash of z look at the spherical derivative if you look at the spherical derivative what I will get I will get see I will get uh, 2 times modulus of f dash of z okay so I will get 2 times modulus of this whole quantity okay divided by 1 plus mod f the whole squared and mod f the whole squared will be mod f uh, mod f is modulus of this quantity so it will be 1 plus modulus of g of z by z minus z0 to the power of n the whole square this is what I will get okay this is what I will get and now you take limit z tends to z0 now you take limit uh, z tends to z0 of f hash of z you take you calculate this limit what will happen is you see the in the denominator you have 1 plus mod g z the whole square divided by mod z minus z0 to the 2n okay. So, denominator will go to uh, infinity uh, the denominator will go to infinity faster than the numerator. So, this so the whole quantity will be bounded as z tends to z0 that is the whole point. So, you see uh, if you calculate it okay if you calculate it what will happen is so 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 uh, so let uh, 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 so this exists so so if you write it out um, you know i'm going to get uh, so i'll i'll to simplify things i'll multiply both numerator and denom denominator by z mod of z minus z0 to the 2n okay which is what is the common denominator so what i'll get up get is that i'll get well let me write this here uh, f dash of uh, uh, sorry f hash of z is going to be uh, 2 times 
uh, I'll I'll get the numerator of this, which is mod z minus z naught to the n. Uh, so I'll I'll get this uh, mod z minus z naught to the power of n g z uh, uh, minus uh, g z. Uh, oops, I think that must have been a, that's a g dash of z. So this is a g dash of g dash of z minus g of z n into z minus z naught to the n minus one mod divided by okay i have multiplied by i have multiplied by uh, this uh, modulus of this quantity mod z minus z naught to the 2n okay so uh, that's gone and the and the denominator i'll get mod z minus z naught uh, to the 2n plus mod g z uh, the whole square this is what i'll get if i multiply by mod z minus z naught to the 2n okay and uh, mind you the spherical derivative is an absolute derivative so it's only absolute value it's a, it's a post non negative real value by the way now you now you do uh, if you take limit as z tends to z naught what's what's going to happen you see as z tends to z naught this term will vanish because uh, z minus z naught power n is there and of course this n is of course greater than or equal to 1 okay it's the order of a pole so it's a pole of order 1 or higher okay so this is going to vanish and this fellow here uh, what will happen here uh, depends on whether n is equal to 1 or n is greater than 1 okay see if if n is equal to 1 what is going to happen if n is equal to 1 then this term does not exist okay and I say let z tends to z naught I will get I will get uh, 2 times uh, mod g z naught okay because g is anyway mind you analytic it is continuous so limit z tends to z naught g z is g z naught and modulus is also a continuous function so I can push the limit inside the variable okay uh, inside the argument of the function uh, and then uh, that is what I will get in the numerator so this is if, if this is if n is 1 okay this is if n is 1 and in the denominator what I am going to get this this term is going to vanish as it tends to z0 I am going to see I simply get mod g uh, again I will get mod g z0 the whole square I will get divided by mod g z0 the whole square which is just 2 by mod g z0 this is what I get and mind you g z0 is not 0 because g z0 is uh, 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 g is the uh, you know if you want uh, uh, g is the analytic uh, function divided by uh, uh, z minus z0 power n which is equal to f in the in the neighborhood of f in fact you know g z0 is if you check very carefully g z0 is the uh, is the coefficient of the uh, uh, of 1 by z minus z0 power uh, capital n if you write out the Laurent expansion okay and that is not supposed to be 0 okay uh, because g ha f has a pole of order capital N right. So this is what you will get and you see and mind you in the case that n equal to 1 g z0 is actually the coefficient of 1 by z minus z0 power n which is 1 by z minus z0 but you know what is the coefficient of 1 by z minus z0 called it is called the residue. So actually this is 2 divided by the residue of f at z0 that is what it is this is nothing but 2 in 2 divided by modulus of residue of f at z0 this is what happens if you get if, if f is a simple pole n capital n equal to 1 all right and uh, the, the, the point is that if now uh, if, if n is greater than 1 everything is gone because you see if n is greater than 1 there is no problem with the denominator. I will get mod g z0 the whole square this term is anyway going to vanish and the numerator will also go now numerator has a z minus z0 term common so it is going to go so I will get 0 if n if n is greater than 1. So here is the he, so here is the uh, so of course this is on the left I forgot I have forgotten to write f hash of z so, so here is the nice thing f hash of z0 you can now call it see you can define <coughs> Uh, f hash of z0 by continuity to be equal to limit z tends to z0 f hash of z okay if you want to think of f hash as a continuous function okay if you want to think of the spherical derivative as a continuous function then it is natural to define f hash at z0 to be the limit as z tends to z0 of f hash of z okay and you see uh, this uh, this uh, what this does is that it makes the spherical derivative continuous even at z0 and mind you z0 is a pole so what this tells you is that the spherical derivative f hash of z is continuous at all poles 
So, it is continuous throughout the domain and therefore, you know because it is continuous at all uh, throughout the domain, this formula is valid, okay. What I really meant here was what is f hash of z0, okay. Of course, f dash of z0 does not make sense. So, the question is what is f hash of z0, alright. So, uh, so now you know f hash makes sense even at poles. So, this, this so this integral is well defined there is no issue at a as if you are uh, you can you can blindly integrate f hash you can you cannot blindly integrate f dash because f dash will not exist at a pole you can integrate f dash mod f dash only where uh, so long as you are on a path which is not going through any poles. But if it is going through a pole you cannot integrate f dash but you can integrate f hash always even even if you are passing through a pole that is a big deal that is a big deal. So, that is the reason why this formula works and what this calculation we did just tells you is that the, the spherical derivative is actually 2 divided by modulus of the residue of f at the simple pole z0 if z0 is a simple pole and it is 0 if not this is uh, if not means uh, uh, I mean pole of higher order. All right. So, <coughs> uh, so the mo so the moral of the story is that you know uh, you are in uh, you are in good shape. Uh, F hash uh, the spherical derivative is a very nice thing. Okay, and therefore uh, when you whenever you want to f find the uh, arc length, you can integrate. Uh, mod dz over uh, with uh, uh, multiplied with, uh, with with the with the uh, you know integrand as f hash uh, and and that is pretty important okay. Now and you know again I uh, will tell you why we are doing all this we are doing all this because you know somehow uh, the the kind of analysis that is required to prove Picard's theorem uh, is involves uh, Montel's theorem okay. And this, I'll tell you roughly. The idea is that you know there are there are these uh, there is a there is a very close relationship, as I told you, uh, uh, between compactness uh, and uh, sequential compactness and equicontinuity and uh, normal nor, uh, normal convergence, okay, and boundedness of the derivatives, okay. So this is a this is a bunch of results in analysis which is usually. Uh, covered by the Arzela Ascoli theorem, okay, and there is a uh, there is a uh, the Montel's theorem is a uh, is an uh, is something that comes out of that, okay, and why we are doing all this is because you know you the basically you know uh, the idea is that you want to look at a space of meromorphic functions on a domain, okay, so you have some domain, all right, this is a domain in uh, extended plane, so it could in include infinity also, okay. On that domain, you are looking at meromorphic functions, all right, and you are looking. At, you want to think of them at least as continuous functions. So you are allowing the value infinity at a pole, okay. So you are looking at that space of meromorphic functions, and the and you see the the convergence that you are uh, worried about is normal convergence, okay. It's not uniform convergence everywhere. It's only uniform convergence restricted to compact sets, which is called normal convergence. And with this convergence idea, you want to study topology of this space of functions. And, and exp explicitly what kind of topology you want to study compactness, okay, you want to study compactness and you know uh, if you have studied for example in Euclidean space compactness is, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is as good as sequential compactness which is the same as saying that you know every sequence if you have an infinite sequence there is always a convergence of sequence, all right. And so you have compactness is somehow uh, strongly related to sequential compactness, okay. So basically you want, uh, so basically given a, uh, a given a sequence you always want a convergence of sequence, alright. And now you want this also to happen for meromorphic functions, that is the, that is the, that is the central idea. The central idea is give me a bunch of, you give me a sequence of meromorphic functions on a domain and now you uh, try to find conditions, topological conditions that will tell you, uh, topological of course includes also analytic conditions that will tell you that I always will be able to find from this sequence I can find a subsequence which converges but mind you now it is not just convergence it is normal convergence 
my, because in the context of complex analysis, in the com context of holomorphic functions, uniform convergence will not work. You will get only uniform convergence on restricted subsets, namely only on compact subsets. That is called normal convergence. Okay? So, you have to worry about this and, and uh, in order to do all this, see I need to, uh, 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 see the, 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 the boundedness of the derivatives is for example, something that is strongly related to all this. So, I want to be able to work with derivatives. But the problem is the functions I am trying to work with are all what? They are meromorphic functions and meromorphic functions are not differentiable. At the poles they are not differentiable. So, what do I do at a pole with a meromorphic function? What I do is the clever thing is that I do not look at the ordinary derivative, I look at the spherical derivative. The spherical derivative makes sense even at a pole, that is where a spherical derivative comes in, okay? that is what you have to understand. All this is required for me to do analysis on a space of meromorphic functions and that is the kind of, see that is the kind of uh, uh, you know analysis you have to do to prove the Picard theorems. Fine. So, okay. So now, what I want to do next is I want to tell you, uh, well, uh, that uh, th this other fact that I was uh, telling you last time, that you know, uh, the spherical derivative uh, uh, has another important advantage. The spherical uh, derivative allows you to, uh, you know, forget meromorphicity. So it's a very clever trick. You see, uh, uh, on the uh, you introduce a spherical derivative. Because you want to look at a derivative of uh, an, a function which is meromorphic at a pole, for example, okay? That is why you introduce a spherical derivative. But I, the, the, it is beautiful that once you introduce this notion, you can, in most cases, you can even forget the pole, which means you can reduce everything to just studying analytic functions. So, that is the beauty. The reason is, the spherical derivative of meromorphic function is the same as the spherical derivative of its reciprocal. Okay? And what is the advantage of passing through the reciprocal? Uh, passing to the reciprocal, the advantage is that a pole becomes a 0. Okay? And a 0 is a very nice thing, the function is differentiable there. All right? So, that is the advantage. So, that is a that is a that is an added advantage you get free. Okay? And why is this true? This is true because the spherical length that is invariant under inversion. Okay? So, so that is what I want to tell you about next. So, you see, uh, so, so uh, recall that uh, the spherical distance d sub s is uh, invariant under inversion. So, you have the spherical distance between uh, z1 and z2 is the same as the spherical distance between 1 by z1 and 1 by z2, where you know z1 and z2 are now taken to be in the extended complex plane. And in the extended complex plane, mind you, uh, 1 by 0 is defined to be infinity and 1 by infinity is defined to be 0. This is the convention. So, you know the spherical distance is the uh, is actually the spherical distance on the Riemann sphere, okay? which means the distance between two points on the Riemann sphere is given by the length of the minor arc of the biggest bigger circle that passes through those two points and which lies on the Riemann sphere. Okay? And that length, how do you get it? Uh, and that length, uh, you get it by, uh, for example, uh, using basic analytic geometry. Okay? Uh, it is after all length of arc of a circle and you can always derive its formula. And that length you transport it via the stereographic projection to the extended complex plane. So, the advantage of that is that I can measure for example, distance between a point in the complex plane and the point at infinity, okay? I can do, uh, which I cannot do with the usual Euclidean dis distance because you, you, Euclidean distance becomes unbounded as the points, as one of the points is fixed and the other goes to infinity, all right? So, uh, and I told you uh, in an earlier lecture that, you know, the mapping z going to 1 over z which is the inversion mapping, that is a map of uh, C union infinity onto itself. It is a, it's a, in fact, it is a homeomorphism and uh, the fact is that under that homeomorphism, uh, see what it does is that it just maps the uh, extended complex plane back to the extended complex plane, it exchanges 0 and infinity. Infinity goes to 0, 0 goes to infinity. Okay? But on the other hand, since it is a, 
uh, it is a self homeomorphism of the extended complex plane it will also induce a self homeomorphism of the Riemann sphere because after all the Riemann sphere is homeomorphic to the extended complex plane. See whenever in mathematics whenever one object has an isomorphism and you take another isomorphic object then an isomorphism on the first object will aut automatically induce an isomorphism on the second object which is transported by this isomorphism between them. Uh, so the inversion will also induce an, uh, yeah, a, a self isomorphism, a self homeomorphism extended comp of, the, of the Riemann sphere and what is it? It is nothing, I have asked you to check this, you should do it, I hope you have done it. So it is just rotation of the uh, Riemann sphere about the x axis by 180 degrees, that is all it, that is what it is, okay. And you know the, if you, if you take two points on a sphere, okay, and uh, you take the uh, spherical distance between them. The, that RQL distance. Now, if you rotate the sphere, that is not going to change, okay. So, it is invariant under that rotation, all right. And therefore, the net effect is that the spherical distance is invariant under inversion, okay. Now, uh, so this implies that the, uh, the spherical derivative of f is the same as the spherical derivative of 1 by f, okay. And uh, so, so, so why is this for, this is for f in uh, meromorphic, uh, uh, f a meromorphic function on d, okay. And, and why is this true? Because you see, I will tell you, uh, 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 if you want, uh, uh, you can try to do direct calculation, okay, you can do a direct calculation. So, you know, uh, uh, so what is f hash? f hash is just 2 mod f dash z by uh, 1 plus uh, mod f z the whole squared, this is what it is, all right. Now, this is okay where f dash exists, this formula is correct where f dash exists. Let us assume that uh, for, for, for simplicity, uh, let us assume that f dash is not 0 at a point, suppose the derivative does not vanish at a point, 1 by f uh, also makes sense at that point. The, de the de usual derivative of 1 by f also makes sense at that point. So, if you calculate, uh, if you calculate 1 by f hash, what it will, what we will it be? It will be 2 times, you know, I will get modulus of 1 by f dash of z divided by 1 plus mod 1 by f of uh, z the whole squared. Now, if you, if you calculate this, what will I get? I will get, I will get, uh, 1 by f hash is well, uh, 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 you know, 2 times, uh, if you take the derivative of 1 by f, I am going to get uh, minus 1 by uh, 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 f squared uh, into f dash, this is what I will get, okay. If I use a chain rule and then I have to divide by 1 plus uh, uh, 1 by f of z the whole squared mod, okay. And now if I simplify it, you see, uh, I will again end up with 2 times mod f dash of z uh, divided by 1 plus mod f z the whole squared. If I simply uh, multiply numerator and denominator by mod f z the whole squared, I will end up with this which is the same as f hash, okay. So this is a very heuristic, I mean it is a simple calculation, the only thing, we, the only problem with this calculation is that, you know, uh, uh, so uh, I am, uh, I am cancelling of uh, mod f dash, uh, I am cancelling of mod f, okay, and to cancel of mod f, uh, uh, f should not vanish, okay, I, otherwise I cannot can cancel mod f in the numerator and denominator. So this is okay if f is, uh, f is, uh, f of z is, this is okay at a point where f is not 0. Uh, okay, so let me write that uh, valid if f is not 0, uh, that is one thing. Then the second thing is f dash should exist, okay. Derivative should exist, otherwise I cannot write. So, uh, and f dash exists. So, what I am saying is that uh, the spherical derivative of f and the spherical derivative of 1 by f, they are the same, you can verify it at all points of f which are different from zeros and poles, okay. Now what you do is, you check it at a pole using the same calculation that we did last time, alright. And uh, you will see, 
uh, by last time, I mean just some time ago, we did this calculation to calculate uh, the uh, f hash of z0 at uh, a pole z0. That is by basically writing out f uh, locally uh, at the point z0 which is a pole in, the, in this form f is equal to g by z minus z0 to the n, all right. And you use the same calculation, if you use the same calculation, what will happen is that you can see that when f is 0 uh, at a point, that is at a point where f has a 0 or uh, at a point where f has a pole, the same calculation is correct. What you do is you calculate in the deleted neighborhood and then you let limit z tends to z0. You do it both at a pole and at a 0 and you will see that the limit will exist and whether you calculate the limit for 1 by f or whether you calculate the limit for f, you will get the same thing, okay. So, uh, so that's, uh, that is that I leave it to you as an exercise, okay. So, one of the, uh, one of the important things is that, see one of the important things is that, you know, if you take the spherical length of uh, f of gamma, okay, uh, this is going to be by definition an integral over gamma f hash of z mod dz and since f hash is 1 by f hash, this is also integral over gamma 1 by f hash uh, of z mod dz and this is by definition the spherical length of 1 by uh, f of gamma. And f of gamma and 1 by f of gamma they only differ by an inversion and under an inversion the spherical length should not change, so it is correct, okay. So, this way also you see uh, that uh, uh, the you know uh, you can when you calculate the spherical derivative whether you calculate for f or whether you calculate for 1 by f there is no difference, okay. So, uh, what is the advantage? Suppose you are uh, proving something involving spherical derivative and suppose you have to deal with a point which is a pole, okay. Suppose I have to deal with a function f uh, at a point which is a pole and suppose I am working with a spherical derivative without loss of generality, I can uh, replace f by 1 by f because by replacing f by 1 by f, my spherical derivative does not change but my pole for f becomes a 0 for 1 by f and f 1 by f becomes analytic. So, I am dealing with a nice analytic function, okay. So, that is the advantage of having the spherical derivative, okay. So, now what we will do is in the, in the forthcoming classes, uh, we will use all this, uh, all this background that we have de uh, developed so far to, you know, uh, in a series of lemmas and propositions and finally theorems, we will we'll prove the Picard theorems, okay. And on the way we get the very important Montel theorem, okay. So, I will stop here.